not long ago in various places around my house and on my commute to work, I began listening to Star Wars Minute. The conversational podcast dissects each Star Wars movie by the minute, producing some of the most interesting and entertaining content in the podcasting galaxy. The fun that co-hosts Comic Book Alex and Pete the Retailer have with their guests shines through in each installment of the show and directly inspired not only the style of my program, but the creation of it in the first place. Star Wars Minute is therefore directly responsible for the EPS podcast. I could not and cannot be any more grateful to Alex for agreeing to be a guest on my show to dissect the original Star Wars movie from 1977 as a document of its time period. I hope you enjoy this anniversary episode of the EPS podcast, where everything is a primary source. Welcome back to the EPS podcast, where everything is a primary source. I'm Eric Paul. And I'm so glad that you're joining me today because this is this episode uh, that we're going to be documenting today or recording today. And if I sound a little bit nervous, it's because I am uh, spending time right now doing a recording with one of the people that is uh, essential to um, me doing this podcast thing in the first place. Um, A couple of years ago, I started getting into listening to podcasts a lot more. Um, and I loved how podcasting allows such a wide scope of, of topics. And as a Star Wars fan, I started to explore what was out there when it came to um, Star Wars podcasts. And I came across this, this show called Star Wars Minute. And uh, at first, I thought it was a program of just, you know, one minute long, you know, explanations about Star Wars news kind of thing. But then as I listened to a few episodes, I realized, well, it didn't take me a few episodes. The first episode I listened to, I could tell it was all about analyzing each Star Wars movie minute by minute. And I was hooked. I thought it was just fantastic. So Alex Robinson, who's a co-host of that show, uh, was nice enough to join me on the EPS podcast today. And thanks for for coming on. Hello there. Glad to be here. Um. Just before we get into to doing what I do, uh, what was it that prompted you and uh, Pete the Retailer to start um, Star Wars Minute all those years ago? Uh, I had been the co-host of a uh, podcast called The Ink Panthers um, with my co-host Mike Dawson. And when he would go, when Mike would uh, uh, take a break or whatever, or go, you know, uh, take a week off, uh, I invited Pete who was a friend of mine outside of podcasting to come on because we both know we liked talking about star Wars and mm-hmm. uh, we hit it off well enough where Pete was brainstorming ideas. And um, there was a star or a star Trek podcast thing called mission logs. I don't hmm. remember the exact, and uh, they basically went through each episode at a time. And Pete's like, well, we can't go through each episode at a time. We'll yeah. only have at the time six episodes. Right. So uh, that's when he, he came up with the insane genius idea of breaking it down one minute at a time. And uh, so we, yeah, we pretty much uh, took it from there. We found out uh, afterwards that there was uh, a podcast called gutter balls, uh, hmm. which went through the big Lebowski one minute at a time, oh, nice. <laughs> uh, which we were unaware of, but that, you know, I guess we both kind of came across the same yeah. uh, concept, but um yeah, so there you go. That's pretty much how yeah. the minute minute by minute format well, was. It's it's a brilliant idea, and I've heard others, you know, since yours. I, I've listened to um, Goodfellas Minute and uh, a few others, and I, I just I love because it's exactly it fits podcasting so well because it's so detailed. There's no like time constraints. You can make an episode that's 30 minutes or an hour and a half. It doesn't really matter. And people just, it's like putting a microphone in conversations that 
would normally go on anyway. Um, and so I was inspired, like I said before, it was, it was one of those things, my son and I, who my son is right next to me actually right now playing Wii. Um, the camera doesn't work right now, buddy. So you can't say hi to you, but uh, it, you know, we will drive on our way to school or, you know, playing Legos or something like that. Just have pod, you know, just have star Wars minute on the background and just, you know, it's, it's perfect you know, theater of the mind kind of thing um, where you can just, you know, get lost and immersed in what you guys have to say about each minute of each movie. So um, what I do is, is not all that dissimilar um, for those of you just listening to the show for the first time, the EPS podcast stands for everything is a primary source, which is also my initials, uh, Eric Paul, and then my last name, which I won't say, but um, what we do is we go, you know, question by question and treating pop culture, in this case, a movie, uh, the same way that a museum artifact would be treated. Um, so we start with the first question. And in this case, it's all about trying to figure out what the original Star Wars movie can tell us about America and the world in the 1970s. Um, so the first question that comes up is uh, what material is this made from? And since it's a movie, I don't know exactly how they make film. Uh, maybe I should. My wife is from Rochester, New York, where most of the Kodak film um, was made for movies for a long time. But I don't know the exact recipe and how to make film, so I'm not too worried about that. But when it comes to the material of the original Star Wars movie made by George Lucas that came out in 1977, um, would you agree of my summation that it's all about those space operas, Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, um, you know, the serials from the thirties, at least to start with, at least as a visual. Yeah, I think, um, uh, basically the, the, the brilliant, the brilliance of George Lucas was to take that sort of sensibility that thirties and forties, uh, movie serials, but treat them serious, treat them seriously among, you know, as a, as take itself seriously and also put throw a lot of money into it. So yeah. whereas the special effects were pretty low budget for those movies, this is kind of like, um, you know, putting a lot more money into it, a lot more effort and so on. So, uh, sort of like an homage in a way, like he wanted to show that he cared about it enough that to give it the true treatment it deserved. Yeah, well, I don't know about deserve. That's a that's a different yeah. question. But <laughs> in but his mind, at least, clearly on some level, like he, he wanted to recapture that feeling of being a kid, being in the movies, mm -hmm. and it being like a incredible fantasy world. So it's kind of funny now that Star Wars is now basically replaced those as, you know, like when George Lucas was making Star Wars, he was incorporating stuff from the movie serials uh, from his childhood. Mm -hmm. But now modern Star Wars makers are making, putting Star Wars, you know what I mean? They're, yeah. it's, it's, the snake is eating its own tail. So, right. Uh, it, it's, it's fun to watch in a way and to observe it from that way. I mean, of course, I've seen all the movies, you know, plenty of times to, to look, you know, to go into each one saying, this time I'm going to look for this, uh, for that particular detail. And, you know, one of the things I've always loved about the Star Wars movies uh, is the use of the wipes you know, when they go from scene to scene and they, they hearken so far back to, you know, to that um, early era of, of movie, you know, Saturday matinee uh, serials in that style. And, you know, we've had a star Wars movie in every decade since the seventies, at least one. And when you get to the more modern one, it just doesn't, it's weird seeing that because they're trying to, they're trying to make a, a Star Wars movie in the 70s, but then also going back to the 30s. And it just doesn't it, it's, it's it seems a little bit, you know, wonky when they when they do it that way, because they have so much, you know, the special effects, it's all computerized and the more modern ones. And yet you're still using this like, you know, uh, you know, the the different kinds of screen changes that they would. Uh, you know, obviously not use a computer for when they originally came up with that. So it always kind of seems funny to me, like you said, to kind of like, you know, be leapfrogging back several, uh, you know, lifetimes, you know, to try to go back and, and get that. Whereas for Lucas, that was, you know, his way of, of like you said, legitimizing that f form of filmmaking in a way. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 
something we've noticed or, or we pay obviously when you break down a movie minute by minute you pay might notice things that other people probably take for granted or whatever but mm-hmm. it's interesting seeing what uh what elements of film language get uh incorporate see them be incorporated to display how much can you change the film language of it and still have it evoke star wars so for instance mm. in, in none of the george lucas um movies have any flashback scenes or flash forwards or time right. jumps or anything like that whereas now that has become a much more standard uh a standard thing and even you know even stuff like moving the camera star war the original star wars the camera doesn't move all that much right it generally tends to stand still and at most you know pan left or right or whatever but now of course you know with with the help of cgi and stuff you can sort of you know move the camera anywhere so how much of that can you do and have it not and have it not feel like star Wars anymore. That's the, that's the real question. We've gotten to a place now with, with the way the star Wars movies have gone. I've heard you mention this on your program before about how it's almost as if um, each time period, like the the stories have always existed. You know, they're always been there, you know, whatever happened to Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, they just recently got around to telling that story, but it's always been there. And each iteration of star wars each time period is just kind of like that era's actors telling that story it's kind of like you know uh disney's robin hood was the uh animal kingdom the cartoon animal kingdom their turn at telling that story um and so it's it is right i mean because since the 70s we have you know movie makers have gone and made their movies differently like you said with the you know, fast moving chase scenes and, you know, the, the super duper special effects that make it look like you're, you know, riding alongside, you know, these space horses, you know, running on a, a, you know, star destroyer or something like that. Like that's, that would not have even been possible. I, you know, watching the original film, you watch some of those scenes and like the lens is totally different. It's a different kind of like appearance of the film and then you also have like these close-ups. You know, I always think of this scene uh, in the hangar when they're getting ready to to go attack the Death Star, and and Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia are those up close. It looks like a soap opera from the same time period. It's just it's it's so different, and that wouldn't even cross somebody's mind in a modern Star Wars movie making to go that way. Um, so, you know, so much of it is documents of the seventies, you know, that's how they made movies then. And, uh, even if he was trying to do something, you know, that was, uh, retro in a way it came out the way that it did because he really had no choice in the seventies to do it that way. Um, who, you know, so the, the next question is who likely made it and what was their status and role in society? Um, nowadays, when we think of George Lucas, we think of a guy, I, I don't know if you've ever seen like those uh, memes that people make of, you know, the the Star Wars Lego George Lucas playset where it has, you know, little uh, Lego star, you know, George Lucas. And it's just like piles of money <laughs> is the is the playset. set. Um, we kind of picture him as like this king or maybe emperor, you know, kind of overseeing this this huge empire of dreams that he made. Um, but in the time period when he was making star Wars, uh, that was certainly not his status in society. Was it? No, certainly not. I mean, obviously, you know, he was, he had had, uh, I guess American graffiti was, uh, a huge hit, uh, for its time. So he had that amount of, of, I guess, status, but, you know, Star Wars was a fairly low budget film for what they for what he was trying to accomplish. So yeah. it's not like they were like, "Oh, George Lucas, we'll hand you you know however much money you want." Um, and I think for him that independence and he always wanted that, so he worked hard to get that for himself. Um, you know, like with the you know the the prequels were basically the lo- biggest indie films ever yeah. made. So. Uh, um, yeah, so it was definitely a different guy back in 1977, yeah. though. And that's wild to think, too, because I remember going to see, you know, episode one in the theater and um, 
I definitely didn't see myself as going to see an independent movie. You know, it wasn't clerks. It was, uh, sure. you know, there's kids that dressed up in costumes. There was, you know, it was a regular, it was in the mall, the movie theater, you know, it wasn't like the, mm -hmm. the arts, art, arty, you know, art, art theater out on the, you know, downtown area. It was just like, you know, you go in there and, you know, Taco Bell is selling the cups with, you know, the things on it. So it's so funny to think that that, is something he still stood by all throughout is that, you know, the independent filmmaker thing, because in the seventies, when he's making the movies, um, you know, the film industry had been really hurt hard by TV, uh, you know, showing up and, and taking a lot of the audience away. And it seemed that um, a lot of the, the movies that were being successful in that era and science fiction fantasies weren't one of them. Um, were basing it on things that they couldn't possibly show on TV, you know, like ultra violence, language, you know, sexuality um, that would never pass censors on, on television. That's what was in the movies. Um, so by comparison, it's like when he comes up with, you know, star Wars, it, it's like, well, you know, the, the main thing that really couldn't be on television in that in that sense um, was the fact that, uh, you know, it was, it was um, so huge, you know, wide scoping and the special effects and stuff like that. But it seemed that as a, um, you know, just a, a status of the entire industry, it was really like relying on these young, energetic, vibrant filmmakers like Lucas and Spielberg and, uh, and all the rest. Um, what does that, tell you perhaps about the the 70s is there a particular reason why you think other than just tv being everywhere uh that stopped people from going to the theaters for a long time well uh i think the um i'm not i mean i don't think it was to the extent that say home video is uh if anything i feel like the 70s was kind of a golden age for adult cinema not adult in the pornographic sense but adult right. in the sense that it was dealing with like uh you know not more serious topics but like you said it could, tv at the time was we, we kind of have flipped things now because tv in the 70s was a very dumb medium mm -hmm. like it was aimed at lowest common denominator there were only like six channels to choose from so there wasn't really much you know choice and you had to you had to aim shows at the broadest possible audience now television shows are now movies are very dumb mm -hmm. and are aimed at the broadest possible audience many of whom for of whom english is not their first language and so uh whereas television now like i guess people are saying we're in the, the platinum age of television or yeah where there's shows now that are, are smarter and more sophisticated than they've ever been at any time in history so um i think um I, Lucas himself said that part of the reason he wanted to do Star Wars was that films at the time had become very uh, cynical and very, um, you know, not much hope for the future. And yeah. he wanted to create something that would, uh, like, be aimed at young people and sort of be a kind of fantasy world to, yeah. to, that would sort of capture that more fairy tale kind of feeling about of optimism and 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 so on. So and I, I, that that segues perfectly into, you know, why did they make it? Because, you know, the short answer of that, of course, is a movie maker makes movies. But even the the smallest, like his his student film uh, that he made, THX 1138, there's a lot of effort that goes into that. You got to get a lot of, you know, and I know that that turned into a bigger movie for him. You know, his original student film was much shorter, but you know, even the, the shortest, you know, seemingly less complicated movie that's, you know, 15, 20 minutes long is going to take the better part of a few weeks to, you know, from start to finish. And um, so when a studio or a filmmaker both come up with the idea of, okay, this is the story we're going to go with. This is how we're going to make it. Uh, it's a huge commitment and there has to be a really good why. And given all that was going on in the seventies, um, it seems like that was a perfect time to do exactly what you just pointed out of, you know, instead of, cause being cynical in that era seemed like it'd be, be a pretty easy way to, to feel. 
uh, seeing everything yeah. that was going on. Um, and to go completely the other direction of simplifying the storytelling and, and having a, a pretty straightforward good guy, bad guy uh, situation and easy to follow conflict um, and plot line, uh, you know, it, it goes without saying that's why he wanted to make it. Um, would you say that it's as, as simple as that, that, uh, you know, as a lot of movies, especially groundbreaking ones like Star Wars, that it was um, because of the the dark clouds that had settled over uh, the country and the world that, you know, that's why, you know, he, he made it that way or, um, yeah, because I, I didn't live in the seventies. So I don't have that same kind of, you know, literally primary source uh, look at it. I base it a lot on, you know, what I have seen presented to me in other ways. Um, does it seem like that would be a fair theory uh, that I have of, of it's like, you know, kind of pushing up against the, you know, the, the darkness in a way. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that was Lucas, part of Lucas's stated intentions, although it's, it's always tricky with George Lucas because he is not the most reliable narrator when it comes to uh, his own story, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he contradicts himself a lot and will attribute things he'll contradict himself from like what past interview. If you read interviews from like 1978 and then you read interviews with George Lucas now, they don't necessarily jibe as to, so it's, it's difficult sometimes to tell yeah. what his real um, thought process was. One thing I found really intriguing uh, was at one point, George Lucas was considered doing a trilogy of war movies. He was going to do a movie. He was going to do apocalypse now and he was going to do star Wars. And then he was going to do another war film. Um, and obviously that didn't pan out, but mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. Uh, I'm always, I'm always fascinated by the idea of what if George Lucas did not turn into Star Wars guy? Yeah. Like what if he had done Star Wars and then said, okay, now I'm going to work on some other movies, and like Star Wars is just one of his, right? One of his, you know, so uh, kind of like what Steven Spielberg did, <laughs> it, you know, not just doing one thing. Like he has produced many different kind of films. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but part of the reason it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's a, it's a, the tragic irony, the, the, the tragedy of Darth Lucas, the wise was that he <laughs> was like, okay, star Wars was a hit. If I do more of these, they will be financially lucrative and that will give me the financial freedom to be able to make whatever kind of movies I want. Mm -hmm. And the, the tragic irony is that by the time he was done doing those, he was so like, entombed in star wars that he could never do anything else he, he was he was the darth vader of of yeah. his own story so it's uh i i recall i think it was when you guys were covering uh revenge of the sith that um you know i think it may have been you that that posed that theory of that you know star wars is the dark side and you know lucas is anakin and he's combating with it um, with, you know, whether or not to give in completely to it, because I think by the time you get to that movie being made, it, it was all over for him. There was no way he was going to be able to, you know, come back and say, all right, I'm going to make, you know, a completely different kind of film because he had become, you know, George Lucas of Star Wars and that's it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, he could have, but it's yeah. I mean, the older you get, the harder it is to, to, you know, if you were to give that freedom to George Lucas in 1977, I'm sure he could have come up with all sorts of crazy stories right. he wanted to do, but you know, 60 year old George Lucas, not quite as yeah, he's... <laughs> quite as uh, much energy as, as that. So. Yeah. I've seen it before, you know, and happened and you know, I, I like watching NFL football and I remember when, uh, you know, Joe Gibbs of the Washington Redskins, he had been very successful coaching the team in the eighties into the nineties. And then he retired for a while, came back in the early two thousands and was okay, but he just wasn't, he didn't know the, the game had changed so much that he didn't know how to, to play a modern football game with, you know, when to call timeouts and, you know, freezing kickers and all that kind of stuff. And it was like, you know, maybe he just sort of stuck to, you know, owning a race car and <laughs> not trying to come back. <laughs> and so maybe George Lucas also, you know, he did race cars. I know he's uh, in American <laughs> graffiti. He's um, his equivalent would be uh, the, what's his face in the, the yellow hot rod. Um, John, 
Milner. Yeah. Milner. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the, and these questions that I have, it's just something my students become very familiar with right away because I want them to analyze, 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 and I put them in the order, but they're not, you know, steadfast in that, that they'll give a lot of answers that are, you know, remarkable when we figure it out. But the, uh, where was it made, uh, when it comes to star Wars, we're talking primarily, you know, a lot of the, the scenes are, are shot in England at, um, I always confuse the two. Is it, uh, the pine pinewood studios? Is that the one that, the, or is it the, I know there's L street is another one, but, um, yeah, I lost track of which ones were yeah. there. The L street. I think it was L street. Uh, L street was the original star Wars. Movie. Okay. And then they, so, cause I, I'll just say London. Right? <laughs> so, sure, yeah. I, and I, I, I remember seeing a documentary a little while ago and wasn't nearly as interesting. I thought it was going to be, but it was about all the extras um, yeah, I'm much part of that too. And it was like all these English guys and, you know, they're, uh, you know, lined up outside in their various uniforms. And it was almost like watching uh civil war reenactors or something where, you know, and they're making a big, uh, you know, war epic and, you know, one minute he's dressed as a union infantry guy. And they're like, Oh, we need a, you know, a Sergeant for the Confederacy over there later on and, you know, switches sides. So like you be watching star Wars and the guy that's, you know, running around the background in a rebel uniform could easily be operating the, uh, you know, the controls of the Death Star in the next scene. But uh, that also had to do with a lot of the, you know, this had never been done before and the budget was kind of all over the place with it. But uh, also Tunisia and California, a lot of Southern California for the the reshoots of the Tatooine scenes. And then um, the special effects were, you know, done largely in California as well. Uh, I guess what I get out of that, as far as, you know, what it tells me about the America and the world. And again, this isn't like earth shattering type stuff, but is that the, you know, the industry of movie making and the apparatus to make it, um, it had been very much uh, almost steadfastly in, in the United States anyway, in California, particularly Los Angeles, um, I know Lucas and, you know, Zoetrope with uh, Francis Ford Coppola were up in San Francisco, but uh, that West Coast, you know, movie industry persisted. It wasn't like they were as a lot of, you know, filmmakers do now where they go off to Georgia or uh, Canada and, and make their movies up there. Um, and then England, you know, they were obviously continued to be that, you know, cultural uh, exchange point for the United States where, you know, we kind of collectively make a lot of our same media. And in that time period, you know, it's that, that back and forth had it continued. It wasn't like it was uh, a new thing for the countries to, to share in a lot of the actors and the writers and the uh, movie makers and the studios and stuff like that. So not a, not a huge groundbreaking thing uh, to cover, um, do you see anything else involved with the, where it was made, um, per, component to it that I might be missing? No, I think that pretty much, uh, I think budgetary reasons were largely the, uh, you know, tax incentives and whatnot. That's the same reason that a lot of the prequels were filmed in Australia for the same yeah. reason, just, uh, it was cheaper. Um, but then the next part is the locations associated with it. And that's when things really start to show for the time period, you know, not only of course, all the, the fantasy locations could mirror or match the classic stories that, um, you know, it's based on, I know that, uh, it, you know, it's not a novel thing to say that there's a lot of wizard of Oz referenced and you know inspired into star wars you know farmer kid you know the kansas and tatooine being a similar place to one another um and so you know you could extend that metaphor throughout the entire film with different locations and and stories that already exist um in history but as far as it showing up in theaters um it was a gigantic hit no matter where you were in the world. Uh, so you got to see it when it first came out. Is that true? That is correct. And, and you saw, I know you've mentioned it before in your program, but um, you're, you're from New York originally, right? Yes. And what was that? Was it like something you had to be like kind of 
coaxed him to go sing or would do you remember like it was all the buzz beforehand no i had no idea what it was or anything i was only six years old when it came out and uh this was back in the 70s where you know there's not the media saturation there is yeah. today and so my father who i think had seen it already um uh, very astutely said that if he figured out that I would probably enjoy this movie. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he took me to it. I distinctly remember uh, when uh, R2 and 3PO arrive on Tatooine, I remember turning to my dad and saying, are they on earth now? <laughs> my dad being like, Shh, just because I just assumed that at some point these yeah. aliens would be coming to earth. It really makes sense. And so, uh, yeah, I saw it. Um, I guess over 30 times probably in the theater prior to it being, you know, like say, yeah. before 1980, I probably saw it 30 times in the theater because in those days before home video and stuff, uh, they released, they re-released it every summer in like right. the summer of 78, the summer of 79. And I think even when empire came out, they re-released that summer as well. So, and this was back in the seventies where the parents could say, okay, we're just going to drop our kids off at the movies and we'll right. come pick you up in five hours after you've <laughs> seen the movie two times. And so, uh, yeah, it was a very different uh, experience, but, um, it, it, yeah. you know, and I think, so I was born in 81 and I have this very vague memory, but I, I know it's there of seeing, and I think it was Return of the Jedi that I saw was the first movie I ever saw in the theater, but that came out when I was two years old. And I really don't picture my parents necessarily taking a two-year-old to go see a movie. So it may have been something very not. similar where they just kept you know, re-releasing it because I have a distinct memory uh, and I could even tell you the exact theater I saw it in. I drive past it all the time um, and, and it, it no longer exists, but where, you know, the, the spot where it was. And I still remember seeing the the big uh, lights hang down from the ceiling. And then I have a, a distinct memory of seeing Luke Skywalker in his X-Wing uh, approaching Dagobah. And so I don't remember if it's from Empire or Return of the Jedi, but, you know, talking to R2, and that was like my first movie memory. Um, so there's a good chance that it was part of some kind of re-release kind of thing. Um, but it's like you said, like I, I was talking to some people um, I do, uh, I call it podcast karaoke where I, I go to different uh, locations like museums and, and breweries and stuff like that. And I just bring stuff with me and I brought the, uh, and, and just guests stop by and we do a quick, you know, one of these uh, back and forth about a pop culture thing. And we, we, uh, I, I talked to a few people about uh, the soundtrack for Greece, uh, which came out just a year after star Wars and mm -hmm. um, accurately. And they were people that saw it just you know, like you did for star Wars several times in the theater because they they didn't have any other option they knew that that was it like if you're gonna watch this movie and that's why they went out and got the soundtrack almost immediately because that was their way of bringing the movie home with them you know because of their household technology they could listen to the soundtrack and the same thing with star wars that that was a huge smash hit for soundtracks as they put out that soundtrack and everybody could since it goes in the exact same sequence as the movie um, you could actually follow along and kind of imagine the movie and maybe play with the toys uh, as you go. So, um, you know, it's, it seems like, you know, a lot of those same people shared that same excitement after it came out because you wouldn't have had <laughs> knowledge about it beforehand. And then the same thing happened again in the mid nineties. I, you know, that was for, I think those re-releases, the special editions were very much, for the generation that came just after the star Wars original kids got to see it, you know, the, those original star Wars kids, cause we didn't get that excitement at all. You know, we were yeah. late to the show, <laughs> you know, we were, we were playing with the toys. We watched the movies over and over. Um, you know, this, the original star Wars was always elusive to me because we didn't have it on VHS. We had taped, um, empire and return of the Jedi off of, uh, HBO so I like my memories of empires always starts with that uh, with the, the cameras going through the H and the B and the O and then like that buzzing sound in the background that you always got when you taped off of those, those channels. 
And so like Star Wars, I didn't see it that often. It was only like special occasions that we would go to the video store and I would convince my family like, this is one we're going to watch this week. And they're like, fine. You know, and then it was not until the mid nineties that we got to experience that same excitement of Star Wars is back in the theater and we made some things, changes to it so that it's yours now. It's not just, you know, re-release of as we had been doing it in the seventies and the uh, early eighties. Star Wars was a direct product of the desperate times in which it was made, and the message and spirit that the movie instilled in the public may have saved aspects of society and culture from the brink of collapse. That's quite a bit of credit to give to a movie, but considering the circumstances, it is deserved. The biggest audience for Star Wars, children, had spent much of their youth receiving mixed messages from pop culture and media regarding good and bad and right and wrong. Star Wars tore through the clouds of doubt and delivered a moralistic story of heroes and villains at just the right time. It marks the time period in many ways, but one of which is by being the antithesis of everything else in the media in the late 1970s. Probably the biggest part of any kind of primary source dissection is when it gets to uh, the next two questions and that is who's the intended audience or user of this thing and what ideas and behavior does it convey and um i mentioned before about the the how how the wizard of oz seems to be pretty well embedded into star wars you know you could go point by point and saying well there's you know little people you know munchkins and jawas and you have a metallic man and you know the tin man and and stuff like that but i think more so as with who these stories are meant for who they're geared towards and um when thinking about star wars as like a modern day fairy tale that people can really you know latch on to and, and get involved with uh it reminds me not only of the 1939 movie, the wizard of Oz, but also the 1900 book, the wonderful wizard of Oz, which it's based on because both of those start out with an explanation of who the story is meant for and why it was, was written in the first place. And um, Al Frank Baum in his book, you know, basically comes out and says, you know, we are at the dawning of a new era where a brand new you know, for all intents and purposes, a brand new country, a new nation has developed in the West. Um, and it's time for new stories. You know, we, we need to build that, you know, goodbye stories of old. We need to make stories of our own in this time and place. And then uh, the Wizard of Oz, the movie does the same kind of thing, just much shorter, of course, because it's a movie um, where at the beginning, it's like for those of you who are young at heart and young in age, you know, this is for you. This is, this is your story. And, you know, the movie came out close to 40 years after the book did, which is, you know, for all intents and purposes, a generation. And then star Wars comes out almost exactly 38 years after the wizard of Oz. Um, so do you think that there's something to that? Like Lucas was trying to offer up in the midst of all that business of the seventies, a new fairy tale. And that was his audience was the young and the young at heart. Yeah. I think that was his, uh, people seem to get, people seem to take umbrage when I call star Wars, a children's film mm -hmm. because they go, you know, cause obviously they're not children and they maybe take it as an insult that they are interested in a product aimed at children. But I don't necessarily see it as a pejorative. Like I, it's the same thing with the Wizard of Oz. Like, it's I, I, it's aimed at very young people, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think mm -hmm. you know, uh, so uh, yeah, I definitely think he was going for a sort of, you know, kind of, I don't know about timeless, but definitely something aimed at younger people because the the everyone is very one dimensional in it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not, it's it's a very simple world. It's literally black and white with good and evil. And uh, I think that's one of the interesting things about Star Wars now is that they're introducing a lot more 
shades of gray into it, morally yeah. complicated characters. And I'm not sure if that I I'm not sure if that works with Star Wars. Yeah. Because like once you start getting into the literally like more complicated characters, then it becomes like it it it, it makes that by diluting that sort of simplicity, it kind of um you know like the fact that Darth Vader turns from quote good to evil at the mm-hmm. end of Return of the Jedi, spoiler alert. Right. Like, <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't from a real world perspective, that does not absolve him of any responsibility for the things he did when he was a bad guy. Mm-hmm. But in the world of a fairy tale, that works perfectly because right. you know, now he's good at the end, you know, it's it's you know, whereas if and if Darth Vader had lived, he would have been put on trial for war crimes and probably right. <laughs> executed by the New Republic. So uh, you know, I don't necessarily. I think it works better as a fairy tale, and yeah. putting that baggage of real world stuff on it uh, doesn't help yeah. things necessarily. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love my Star Wars. I'll watch anything they put out there that has Star Wars fixed to the the title. But I feel very similar to you in that uh, it's we already have enough of that in other media we don't need star wars to start getting into that nitty-gritty of you know the uh real life you know parallels that this you know that we can match things up side by side i give mandalorian a bit of a pass because it almost from before it came out was broadcast conveyed ahead of time saying this is a western you know it's going to have the same kinds of tone and themes as a western does um it's not going to be a you know swashbuckling errol flynn movie or show uh it's going to be but in the 70s it was the same thing there was plenty of movies out there that dealt with the anti-hero you know that gray area type thing and you know he didn't do it then he wanted to go back to exactly what l frank Baum did and exactly what the wizard of oz the movie did of saying here is a pretty straightforward and for the purpose of, and, and L Frank Baum is very explicit in his opening, you know, we need to teach kids morals and values and, you know, to prepare them for getting older. And I I feel like, you know, kids of the seventies, and this is generally speaking, but there's a lot of, you know, suburbia had been growing for a few decades by that point, and uh, kind of a lot of you know kids just looking for a place. They didn't really have as structured of a belonging as probably their parents may have in a community or or whatever. And they were just looking for something to gravitate onto and and hold on to. And um, some of that came out in the form of like comic book stores. You know, by the end of that decade. Um, where, you know, you could hang out with other kids who were interested in the same kinds of stuff, even if you didn't live in the same neighborhood. And um, it, it's almost like he recognized that Lucas recognized that, that there was another uh, a kind of a, a not quite as profound as saying a lost generation like the 20s, but a generation that really needed to have a guiding light again um, that he had and but his generation and those before him had and you know that seems to be who is you know sent it It did when your dad saw the movie as an adult was he blown away by it was he like dismissive of it before he had you see it no i feel like he was he really liked it i feel like because he grew up and he was a sci-fi nerd when he was a kid and so Mm -hmm. i guess for him it was you know it was probably closer to George Lucas's age where this was stuff he had seen as a kid, yeah, clunky, low budget serial form. So seeing it, you know, treated with respect and, and a relatively large budget was, I think he just, you know, he, he was, he, when he went to see the, I took him to see uh, episode one and uh, he hated it. Yeah. So, I, cause so. <laughs> I had a very similar experience. So like my dad, I remember when he he told me about it, he's like, there was, it was so great seeing that movie, you know, Star Wars. It was amazing. And I showed him, I, I brought the DVD home of episode three. Cause I, I, I remember seeing that opening sequence in the theater and I thought it was amazing just how, you know, involved it was. And he was watching it and he's just like, 
Yeah. Okay. You know, he just, he was like, that's just not, he didn't do it for him, you know, cause it just looked like any other CG, I, you know, explosion fest that you'd find on, you know, cable um, in the same time period. It wasn't as, as mesmerizing. So it, it was like, you know, and so I forget exactly George, is George Lucas a baby boomer or is he before born before the war? Uh, I think, you know what? I don't know his birthday off the top of my head. I'm going to guess he was probably born. I don't know. It would probably be either just after the war or maybe at the tail end of maybe like 42 or 43 mm-hmm. or something. You know what? I'm going to look it up while we're <laughs> asking. Uh, rather than, because I know someone right now at home is yelling into the, right. into the, uh, into their microphone. But like, um, oh, maybe George Lucas himself. He's like, <laughs> George Lucas was born 1944. Okay, so he's just, just, just there under the just. So, just I mean, pre-baby. yeah, I mean, so he wasn't completely dis- detached from you know yeah. people in that generation. He was he was part of that generation for all um, you know definitions of it. And so I'm just kind of thinking that that probably had something to do you know with it as well because his youth growing up was you know going to those kinds of you know. TV was still in its infancy. And even on the TV, they were watching stuff like that. The same kind of thing happened with uh, the, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies. I, I tried to show those to my dad and he's like, that's not Batman. Is it the Joker isn't supposed to be terrifying. He's like, Joker's, you know, uh, George, George Romero, not George, not George Romero, but um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a totally different Joker. Uh, yeah. It, he's like, you know, he's, it's supposed to be silly and not, you know, and ridiculous, not a, uh, you know, a scary crime, you know, thriller. Yeah. So it's, it's, it has everything to do with that. And so I, I think, yeah, Lucas was bringing with him in the seventies when his entire generation was, you know, coming of age as adults and everything like that. You know, I, I think about other movies made in that same decade of, you know, because star Wars is a uh, retro movie. It's a, it's a nostalgia film, you know, and I, I remember I, I taught a class, uh, an adult, uh, learning class years ago where we did a version of this where we used TV and movies from the 20th century to teach about each decade and we watched Star Wars in its entirety as part of the class and I, and I pointed that out I'm like this is a nostalgia movie um, and it's not because they're nostalgic for a faraway place in you know the same way The Great Gatsby is a nostalgia movie um, it's about the fact that this is how movies used to be made. And even if Lucas himself wasn't present when those, those, you know, if he was born after, you know, the age of the, the Saturday matinee stuff, it was still with him as a kid. Like it was, it didn't just disappear. They were still surrounded by that form of, of movie making uh, for certain. So it was like his way of, you know, kind of carrying that torch on in, into the new, much more, um, you know, tumultuous era. Not that you can't get much more tumultuous in world war two, but you know, (laughs) um, you know, he was born in the midst of, of one time period of, of hell and, you know, produce a, a a movie in in another. Um, So, so finally the, the next, you know, the the last question that really, you know, stems a lot of good insight is um, what ideas or behavior does this convey? And, this is really the basis of your entire program, your Star Wars minute, is that each minute of any of these films gets out and I, you know, ideas and behaviors of the time period that the movie was made. Um, do you see a dramatic, we've talked about this a little bit already, but do you see like um, the, the, the behavior component of, making a star Wars movie, has that changed dramatically in the last 50 years in, in your opinion? Cause the ideas definitely have, you know, what's being projected out onto the audience has changed quite a bit um, since 77, but does it seem like it, it's at least trying to function the same way um, as the original? Uh, I, you mean, did it have, did it alter the behavior of the audience? That and and just kind of like, you know, when greenlighting a Star Wars movie, uh, when any of you know the 
you know, the producers of it, you know, put their minds together and say, okay, let's, let's come out with another one. We'll do another trilogy. Um, is it coming from the same place as George Lucas or is it just like ticking a box, you know, be like, yeah, it's been a while since we had one of those. Let's make a star Wars. No, it seems totally, it's, it seems totally like a different, different motivation now. I mean, George Lucas, of course, wanted to make money at it, but I feel like on whatever is in his, he always wanted to, George Lucas always wanted to make money out of it, of course. And obviously the original inspiration was to do a more, a less cynical, uh, inspirational film. Um, but I, I feel like now it's purely a, a like a top down. Okay. We need, we need, we have this golden goose. We spent $5 yeah. billion dollars on let's, let's, uh, let's see how many eggs we can get out of it. Um, okay. And I'm not saying that good art can't be created from such circumstances or mm-hmm. that the, the people who are doing the things now are don't care about it or anything, but it's like, it's a different thing being it like it's George Lucas's idea that he birthed and, and saw to fruition. It's a different thing to be like, okay, I'm going to play in the sandbox that George Lucas built as mm-hmm. opposed to I'm going to build this new sandbox that no one has ever seen before. Right. So, um, yeah, because uh, I'm on, on on Star Wars Minute. You guys watch the movies and talk about them in sequence of their release, uh, not in sequence of you know the the you right. know, from episode yeah. one to to nine. So as you're watching it through time, are you noticing? I'm, I'm sure you're picking up on different versions of storytelling throughout. Like we were saying before, it's it's like not perhaps as deep as time goes on. <laughs> Well, it's, I, uh, now that we are, I guess, uh, I don't know, seven years into the Disney era. Yeah. Is that possible. I know. And I still remember when the, the first teaser trailer came out for, uh, force awakens. Oh, that was exciting. I, it was, I have my problems with the force awakens, but at the time it was definitely the kind of rejuvenating balm that, mm-hmm. uh, that the, uh, franchise needed even yeah. that sounds so cynical and so hollywood but it but it, that, i guess that goes back to that's the that's kind of the function of star wars since the 70s has been to be that like cure-all for you know cynicism and you know an, an angsty society and you know people it's like hey here's a dose of star wars for you you know that'll calm you down um but then that didn't last long with the the newer trilogy uh, you mean the prequel trilogy, or the sequel trilogy, like the the, the newest trilogy. ones where they get really, you know, it, it gets pretty elaborate. You know, it's not as simple as the original ones were, where it's just like, you know, whisk me away to this far off place and I'll enjoy this adventure. It's like you got to keep a lot of things, you know, straight, and then suddenly they do something wild, like you know, reach into a different uh, time and place, you know, in the you know, like how they do that. That has nothing to do with. You know, Star Wars, a lot, a lot of keep straight as you're watching as a viewer. It's not as much of a, you know, kind of turn, you know, escapism as the original one was. Well, and I the- don't think it, I don't think it can be. I don't think as much as I love the original Star Wars, I don't I think if they made a movie like that today, it would people would hate it. Yeah, it would just be it would seem like, oh, it's so simple and the characters are all one dimensional and, and so on. So that's like that's the kind of sad beauty of star Wars is that that original um, like optimism and simplicity, just the more mm. you build on it, you can't go back to that original thing. Cause it'll just seem like, like a baby nursery, like a fairy tale. Yeah. And you know, modern moviegoers do not want that. <laughs> so, so it's uh, I've, I, the more now that we're deeper into the Disney era, I regard more the it as all like fan films basically mm-hmm. like George Lucas had the original vision for better or for worse. There's some grill brilliant stuff in there and some less brilliant stuff for, but I feel like since then it's all been kind of like trying to, I don't know, milk that original golden goose. It, it's kind of <laughs> to mix a metaphor. It, it's a uh, very complex world. You know, I, I dabbled a little bit when I was in high school age and reading some of the 
uh, I guess they call them now the extended universe titles in book form. And I liked them. They were pretty good. And it kept the story alive for me because it was during that, you know, no Star Wars period. Um, but it's it's a lot to keep up with. It's a huge commitment to be a Star Wars fan nowadays. It's not as simple and direct as it, as it once was. And yeah, it's 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 a... <laughs> Um. Yeah, you're, I think you're absolutely right, though. If they tried to make Star Wars as it was in the 70s today, it would be completely rejected by the culture. It just it wouldn't stick and it wouldn't match it. Um, I, I, I assume, have you seen the uh, the documentary about Star Wars that came out um, early in the, the, the prequel trilogy days? It was from like 2003 or four called Empire of Dreams. Sure, yeah. Um, that, I mean, I could do a the... podcast on that, analyzing that, because I not only have I gotten a lot of the information I know about the the story and how it came to be from that, but I, I whenever I, I've shown that in my classes and um, when we're studying the 70s, and I, I always stop it right at the beginning, because before they even introduce the whole documentary, there's... The scene from the Death Star when Luke Skywalker is about to spring Princess Leia from the jail cell, and he says, "I'm Luke Skywalker, and I'm here to rescue you." And I always ask my students, "I'm like, why do you think that they chose of all the clips from the entire Star Wars saga to have that one be what they opened up with?" And I think it has everything to do with that idea of Star Wars rescuing the society and the culture from the seventies essentially. Yeah. Could be. Um, it kind of reminds me of one of my other favorite movies, uh, the Brady bunch movie um, from <laughs> 1995. Cause a lot of the, and it's, it's funny cause you know, the, the seventies have that kind of notoriety for being, uh, you know, Vietnam war, cold war energy crisis watergate you know stagflation even the the bicentennial is overshadowed by a lot of that um you know not not a very happy time at least that's not its reputation but the way they marketed you know the the brady bunch movie in in more than one way was like they're back to save america from the 90s or another tagline is like they're here to make the 90s groovy again or make america groovy again Mm -hmm. um they're here to say there's one that's even like in the cover art has them coming down the staircase and like smashing the world open and it's like they're here to save the world and i'm like so this artifact from the 70s you know supposedly this you know time of of you know badness you know or or you know dark and and terrible things and everybody's miserable has you know, how bad must the nineties be if we need the Brady bunch to save us, you know, and that, that whole movie is all about pointing out how simple they were by comparison, even though, you know, if you jump back 20 years, the Brady bunch, you know, they would never have made that show in the fifties. Um, but by the nineties, they're very wholesome and saccharine sweet and totally naive to uh, the way the world works. And, you know, they almost get carjacked, but they, you know, Greg and, and Marsha just kind of like, you know, dopely get out of it because they're just so out of touch with it. And I have a theory that the movie is actually a science fiction movie because there's absolutely no explanation, you know, it's a, as to why this family is still stuck in the seventies, even though it's, it's clearly the nineties all around them, but it, it, the two always remind me of each other. It's like, and we use that all the time for nostalgia of like using our good memories of a time period because nostalgia and amnesia go hand in hand, right? They're one with the same. And, you know, you think about the good times, including the show, good times, and it will bring you back to a happier place. And I feel like going back to star Wars, that's what was being attempted at least was saying, you know, let's, let's look back on, you know, of all the time periods, the thirties, you know, <laughs> the forties um, with the style of movie that, the, you know, the great depression, who doesn't want to go back to that? You know, I could give you a list of a lot of people that wouldn't want to go back to that, but they were using those simple messages to bring the culture out of, you know, the, the darkness of the seventies, just the same way that um, it 
other other nostalgia films have and other media has done it in more recent times than that um have you have you seen that in any of the other iterations of star wars um of like using that nostalgia factor well the, yeah the, the weird thing though is now the the way they milk that nostalgia is by evoking earlier star wars yeah you know the 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 whole force awakens was basically a a remix of the original star wars trilogy you're just yeah. taking the same basic ideas and shuffling them around whereas you know it's it's uh, and i'm not saying it as a criticism I, I actually really like that about the movie um but um yeah i i don't think it's a coincidence that lucas's hit prior to star wars was american graffiti which is right. another nostalgia you know thing that people were like what are you talking about why are you why do you you know even at the time when he was making it people had no idea that it would be such a huge like why it was important to get yeah. those songs on the soundtrack and those mm-hmm. cars and things like that that uh so um i mean it's also guess, the same time period that you know happy days came out after american graffiti which hit the exact same you know nerve in people's you know of like yeah that brings me back to the happy days you know <laughs> well they weren't all happy days anymore. exactly and, and that's that's what happens with the as time goes on you just kind of forget about the you know the the, the bad memories get swept away and you just look at the the good parts of, of everything um by the way american graffiti is my all-time favorite movie wow. and it is uh you know, and it harkens back to a time period that you know, I was, st- I was still, you know, 19 years away from being alive, but uh-huh. um, I love the soundtrack to it. I think it's, you know, it's fantastic. And uh, I love, I always love stories like that, which, and I guess star Wars technically would be in this category too, that have a very uh, finite time span in this, in the plot that it doesn't take you for, you know, months or years or anything like that. It's like, here's just a, you know, a night, you know, and I and like all of the the plot line can be resolved in a short amount of time. And, My knowledge, uh, American Graffiti was the first one of those movies where it was basically like, you know, like Days and Confused or other movies where it's like, oh, here's one night of everyone doing stuff, and that was the first one movie apparently that did that. Apparently, from what I understand, yeah. And of of like and and Days and Confused goes on to do it too, where they have those little insertions of um you know american graffiti thrown in there right. like milner's car drives by at one point and you know just kind of like having that that style of you know instead of trying to tell you know in an hour and a half a sweeping story of just like you know it's almost like a tv episode length of time of storytelling yeah. as to, a way just to tug at those little you know memory strings in our brains of like oh yeah I had a night like that once, you know, <laughs> um, and, and I, you know, that those deleted scenes from star Wars, which I, it was like, like I said before, like the, the original star Wars, and I won't call it a new hope um, because I, <laughs> I know, you know, the other, the other side, especially of star Wars minute, uh, it does not accept that as a title um, of the movie, but the original star Wars was always that elusive, you know, one for not only me, but a lot of my, friends growing up and i remember my a buddy of mine brought in to school one time a uh you know just some kind of like picture book not like a children's picture book but just like you know photo images you know stills from the movie uh that was from you know i probably it may even come out even before the movie did and it was like there's all these scenes with biggs and luke like luke's wearing that tunic thing and um you know bigs and they're looking through a uh you know uh the the binoculars and i'm like oh yeah because i I had read the the novelization of star wars and i'm like oh yeah i remember that that was you know when he goes to anchorhead and sees all his buddies and uh you know if they had kept that whole sequence in the movie it basically would have been space american graffiti (laughs) um of like him trying to decide what to do and having his friend come and telling him how wonderful it is off this rock and, and all that stuff. And so it seems like Lucas had like a one track moment for a while. He was like, you know, no matter where you are, these kinds of complications or what time period you live in, what world you live in, um, these kinds of choices have to be made. And, and here's the, the outcome of them. If you 
chose you know choose the the road less less traveled yeah um i guess the last thing i'll say is that i i've always also and i don't know if i'm um uh, you know barking up the the wrong tree on this one but i've always felt that the costume design in star wars especially for the rebels was appropriate for the time period in that you know as we were approaching uh and and then the movie came out right after the bicentennial where you know for an entire year it was like you know fourth of july all year long where people were dressing in colonial attire and you know you know reenactment type stuff and and you know betsy ross outfits for women and um and all that that when you see the rebels uh rounding the corner of of their ship that, that's about to be boarded um just the way their their boots are so tall and even like they have the little the vests you know the waistcoats on i can't help but see minutemen you know like very uh american revolutionary war um imagery and they are the rebels and they're about to fight the evil you know bad guys who are you know encroaching on their their land you know a la lexington 1775 so i don't know I if never, i'm i never made that connection that's yeah. an interesting uh, uh angle on it so i don't know if that was it's just me just reading into it too far which i have a tendency to do that's one of my problems is that i, I try to dig too deep into things and then i'm like uh wait it's you know i, I missed the forest for the trees but um I could, as I have many times before, talk Star Wars over and over again. That's also why I love your show, and I promote your show all the time. And anybody that talks to me about podcasts, Thank they you. always have, oh yeah, it's true crime one, or you know, the you know, here's the one about, uh, you know, the inside scoop on. The, I'm like Star Wars minute. That's the one you need to listen to because I remember I was at a uh, a restaurant one time, an outdoor seating a couple years ago, and uh, the table next to me, I could hear it was like four guys all talking Star Wars. And I, my, my wife had gone to use the restroom and I, I walked over to them. I'm like, Hey, have you ever heard star Wars minute? And I, I gave them a rundown of what you guys do. And when she came back, she's like, did you tell them about star Wars minute? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you guys would love Thank it. You. We, we appreciate that. Um, proselytization. Well, it's like I said, at the, the opening of this, it's you guys use the medium of, of podcasting. I think perfectly, you know, you don't, uh bring in you know mainly because of legal issues you wouldn't be able to bring in like clips from the film it's under the assumption that this is the ultimate pop culture everyone knows star wars so you're bound to you know be able to just describe things and people will be like oh yeah i remember that part um but uh thank you alex robinson for taking the time today and uh getting through some some technical difficulties to make this happen on the EPS podcast. Um, where would be the best place for people to uh, obviously listening to your show would be wherever they get their podcasts. Um, what would be the best place to uh, seek out star Wars minute or your own projects on the internet? Uh, yeah. If we are, we are available wherever you uh, get podcasts and you know, we're on the YouTube as well. So um yeah, or if you just go to StarWarsMinute.com, that's the, your one-stop shop for all our stuff. And I can attest it is a very well-organized website and will give you lots of great information and uh, definitely take a look at their back catalog and you're looking forward. You're going to be starting the the final um, Star Wars movie that's at least that's out right now uh, soon, right? You're going to go with Rise of Skywalker comes out um, in a little while. You'll be starting that early, early 2023. Awesome. Well, I'll be definitely tuning in and I know somebody else uh, that's also going to be tuning in, but thank you very much for uh, joining the EPS podcast where everything, including Star Wars, the original motion picture is a primary source. We'll talk to you next time. I am celebrating one year of the everything is a primary source podcast this week. I'd like to thank you for taking part by listening. Please follow and share the podcast on social media, especially Instagram, and consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash EPS podcast. There you can reap benefits such as t-shirts, stickers, and coffee mugs, and depending on the tier, dictate the topics of future episodes. If nothing else, you can feel satisfied that you helped an independent podcaster produce more content for everyone's enjoyment. When we get back on schedule next week, full-length episodes like this one 
will be delivered on Thursdays, while shorter episodes of products of my EPS podcast live exhibits come out on Tuesdays. I look forward to you tuning in again to the EPS podcast, where everything is a primary source.